Hi everybody, uh, the Dimensions logo is just coming on the screen if you need a sync point. And you're joining us for the ninth anniversary spectacular commentary of the Black Christmas remake. Talk about uh, the actual year, it's like uh, 2015 at the moment and it's just at their 29, 29 productions, which is a, a few years into the future at the moment. But obviously, I think you know. Sometimes when it gets to this kind of time of the year, actually, I'll just uh, just say just so anybody knows that uh, my voice is normally probably not the best at uh, the best of times. It's a bit self-deprecating, but I know I know most people aren't a fan of their own voice. But uh, this last week, I've had a little bit of a cold, and uh, normally I'm pretty good at dealing with cold, so it doesn't you know touch wood. Your know, famous last word, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, so I've had a bit of a cold, and then. Uh, Yesterday I went to watch a most exhilarating uh, football contest where uh, a round uh, ball got uh, kicked into a goal a couple of times and so got a bit excited and was shouting and stuff like that so I've um, compounded uh, my, uh, my already kind of slightly strained vocal cords and uh, trying to do my best Phil Anselmo, Tom Araya type growl as I was uh, chanting on the stands there so yeah my voice is... Uh, Probably why it's actually made it so cool. Sound like the uh, the intro to Night Rider, a uh, shadow frightened from a dangerous world of a man who does not exist. Who was the guy that did that? He's the guy who. Um, oh, he's in Bergman films. I'll uh, I'll try to find that out uh, before. Anyway, yeah, but uh, yeah. So we're doing uh, a commentary for uh, Black Christmas, uh, the remake of Black Christmas, uh, no less. This is one of them films where, you know, just sort of, like say, obviously when it gets close to Christmas time and things, and I get, obviously get into its uh, later part of the commentary. Actually talking about, like, uh, like having like a little bit of a cold. I've got to, I've just had a couple of paracetamols and I've got a hot beverage, so try and whack it into submission. And I've got chilli and garlic oat cakes to have later on. So that uh, tomato, chilli, garlic, cheese, oat cakes. That'll do for me. Um... Yeah, but when it gets close to Christmas time, you know, obviously, you know, you sort of think of seasonal movies and, you know, over the years, the different commentaries that I've done, uh, you know, you try to stick up for the underdog and films that uh, the uh, title cards just come on there, Black Christmas, that looks really cool in a dark room or when I saw it at the cinema, it's just bright red background and it's just like really fills up like you know like if you're watching it in like a dark room it's like wow it just really sort of like the intro to clockwork orange and stuff when they've got the big block colors at the start of the uh film uh yeah but sort of you know obviously you think oh, i want to, you know, to try to do a christmas movie or try to do something around this kind of time period um but this is one of them films where and i've only seen this film a couple of times uh, and I've obviously seen the 1974 one quite a bit, but I think both films are pretty. I mean, obviously they've got they've got a certain cult status and everything, but that said, I mean I know the original one has got more sort of respect as the years have gone on. That you know it's like you know I've said this on on a million commentaries that no matter what film you think's the first, if you think oh this is the first film that's had a uh, you know the first western or the first horror movie or uh, even like I was thinking about yesterday what's the very first music video and everyone says oh it's Queen Bohemian Rhapsody and then you know you see all these music videos that came before it or similar you know filmed music pieces and things like that excuse me so you're never gonna oh it was a good shot there if uh, uh, somebody dressed as Santa walking up the corridor yeah so you're never gonna get like sort of um you know, there's always going to be somebody. Oh, this wasn't the first. This this wasn't the first that. But I think the original Black Christmas has definitely got a, and a deserved reputation in my mind of uh, you know, if not one of the first, one of the first films that sort of seem to get everything together all in one place. Like uh, you know, it's set around a holiday time. Like you know, whether it was like you know, Friday the Thirteenth or you know. Uh, you know, like like those like New Year's Eve, those kind of big, huge events and things like that. Then it got like the slasher element in there, and then just the way it was filmed. And I really do think, and I know I say this all the say this all the time about films that were made in 1974, because I'm you know kind of semi obsessed with that year because the year I was born. And things like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Black Christmas, 
I don't think those films have really oddly aged at all, really. And this film, just you know, watching a little bit of this, you know, getting ready for the commentary. And when the when I mean, when I very first went to see this film when it came out, that I thought it was really good. And you you know, sort of yeah. Obviously, when you're dealing with remake sequels, and I've heard, I've heard a few people on the internet saying you could almost take it as you know a sequel because there's people. I think uh, there's one or two people from the original in this, and then uh, God, that guy looks really familiar. Um, and then, like you know, it's obviously built around the same premise and stuff like that. And so, even a lot of horror films that are straight sequels, you know, you know, they're almost remakes in and of themselves. But um, partly why I want to do this commentary as well, and this is like say, I always like to use certain films as a jumping off point to talk about other things. But what's really struck a chord with me recently and it's the same with anything the older you go and you just you you can you're able to step back and you just take a look at the wider picture or something but like christmas and like say you know i was born 74 to to quote uh, to quote robbie williams um uh, yeah so uh you know it's like one of these things where it's kind of like you know, ever since I was looking, okay, that's a great shot there of the sorority, the sorority house uh, there. And this is one thing I loved about this film, and I did think about this a couple of years ago, like thinking I, you know, try to get like a really good version of this film because it was really striking the way the lights look and things like that. Like she, um, I think that's Olivia Hussey. She's in the uh, the original one. Well, that was my shoes then rubbing together. I didn't spray it <laughs> if that were picked up on the mic. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, so even though, like, say, when I was a little kid, like when I was like, you know, seven, eight, nine, you know, that kind of time period, all I distinctly remember was adults saying, "Oh, Christmas isn't like it used to be." Uh, you know, sort of, oh, it's too commercialised now, all people are interested in is, like, really good presents and things like that. And at the time, obviously, when you're a kid, you, you go, oh, OK, you know. And But when you're a kid, it's like that thing of, you know, do you want, like, just free presents? And, you know, it's like, well, of course, you know, you, you'd have to be, you know, have basic superpowers to sort of... Um, deny like you know do you want some cool toys and like you know i was never from a family that had a great deal of money but that said you know most of the people in my family were working at the time i had three older sisters they all had pretty good jobs and so i was you know i didn't realize it at that time but i was quite lucky i got off decent toys and things like that and you know even the things that i couldn't really people couldn't really afford they did the best to try and get me like when i wanted a computer uh, I feel like Facebook really asked for a car, I got a computer number one, I asked for a computer, I got like, not a brand new Commodore 64, I got a second hand Commodore 64, and uh, my sister was a manager at Woolworth, so I, you know, when there was like, the, you know, the big toy one year was Optimus Prime, and I was like, lucky I got one, because my sister works in the shop, so like, you know, I, I can't really complain, but that said, when I grew up, it was just like a, you know, a council estate, loads of working class families and, you know, people that either were working or on an unemployment benefits and things like that. But there was never a great deal of money going around. And looking back on it, even kind of then, I knew people that didn't really have much at Christmas and really struggled. Uh, and even like, say, even though I got toys at Christmas, it was always one of them times where same with anybody once you start getting all your family members together and a lot of people in my family like drinking that's all they surprise like uh, you know I've, I've uh, took it down as a family tradition like loads of people in my family love drinking and then you you mix all these different groups of people together different political people viewpoints and you know people who are racist homophobic and things like that and like you know even as a kid that like you know you were like oh no it was all just kicked off and everything so it was always like this weird time period for me where yeah obviously as a kid you know, you, you're like oh to free toys and everybody's dead excited but i always had that like nervousness around christmas that sort of you know it was never this 100 percent oh everything was all like you know sunshine and roses and things like that that's some great shots there the, the flashing lights here uh, christmas tree lights here uh, around the picture frames and stuff there illuminating the the corridor and things so yeah but then and then, then taking that step further the more the years have progressed and like I say i always had a kind of 
you know, you say, I, I like the toy element of Christmas, but I didn't like everything else. And then as you start getting older, you think, well, you know, you, you only go, to, you know, to your you know, family for like, you know, like I say, a lot of times I would just go because my mum wanted me to go there and stuff. And quite a few times I would almost quote unquote jokingly say I wasn't going to turn up for Christmas. I'd say, oh, I'd rather just stay at home and, you know, have a Christmas pot noodle and watch the Christmas Top of the Pops and get annihilated. Like, you know, like, you know, just watch, like, you know, and people, are like, oh no, you've got to come down at Christmas and all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, just like little things like that, the more, you know, the more the years progress and things. And then, you know, I was never a super religious person, full stop. But in the last few years, I would say that I would class myself as like an atheist. So, like, like the, even the religious aspects of Christmas was never. That's a bit of a like that bit of a nod to the quote unquote original, uh, the person in the rocking chair. Uh, but yeah, so like say um, that yeah, that was never. So the religious aspect of Christmas was never that much of a big deal to me anyway. But my sister always used to go to church, and my dad would occasionally put like records on of like you know. Uh, you know, Perry Como Christmas story and records that were, you know, a certain choir that was recorded in a church or something. So there was always a little crossover, you know, period. I never is really ever associate Christmas with religion anyway, which sounds like a ridiculous thing to say. But yeah, but there's more as the years progressed that like didn't want to go to my family necessarily. I mean, even though I still do, you know, like, you know, it's been sucking into it really. But like, even though like say, so, like, you know, the family element, I'm not particularly that fussed about. The religious element, I'm not particularly that fussed about. Once you get past, like, you know, 18, 20, 21, the present element gets scaled back. And, you know, I st- it's still even now, like, and I must be getting, up, must be getting you know, soft in my old age. But, like, even now, if you got socks or pants, I'm like, yeah, I've got socks, I've got socks all year and stuff like that. So it's always one of them things where, you know, so that element of it is, everything has been sort of watered down to me in terms of like say there was always that element of it like say that and I never thought it was true years ago but when people said oh Christmas is too commercialised now but all that element of it that sort of I'm more consciously aware of now that you notice people getting crazy like in the last couple of weeks and I've always been lucky in this regard that even when I was pretty excited for Christmas, you know, like, it was like a sort of, you know, 70-30 tough, is that right, 70-30 type thing that, like, um, I'd say, I was always lucky, because I was always the idiot, broke-ass brother that, like, very rarely got presents, and, you know, and if I, you know, if I did get presents, it was like a bonus, and if I didn't buy them, people were like, oh, well, you never buy his presents because he's a moron. And then when it comes to the Christmas dinner element of it, like say, the proper sex is but growing up in a traditional family, mom, three sisters, I did none of the cookie. They probably wanted, wanted me to anyway because I would just messed it up and just put way too much salt in there and stuff like that. Pretty gruesome this film. Like, I always think, that's always a weird thing with this film, it's like the eye thing, which is like, I've never been to something like Clockwork Orange again. I've never been a big, huge fan of things to do with eyes and anybody having their eyes interfered with or messed with it always freaked me out so like they're where they're having their eyes gouged out that was always a weird thing and so yeah like even the the christmas dinner part like i never had to cook the meal i say you didn't really have to you know occasionally I'd wrap presents up somebody said oh i can't i'm not don't really like wrapping presents up you wrap them up and things like that I might write on a couple of cards and things so yeah so i always got pretty scot-free really like you know it's just a case of you know watching like the queen's speech and stuff and things like that but that's what I was saying that, like, you know, when you get, like, you, you, your family coming in and fucking things up, one's better word there. My family, the ones that used to go to the pub, used to always come back during the, the Queen's speech. And even now, I love watching the Queen's speech on Christmas Day. And even now, when it gets to the Queen's speech, I'm like, oh, this is where my drunk idiot family members, the, the, the other idiot drunk family members, apart from myself... <laughs> so you've got that element of it that, like, you know, you just, like, you, know, you could just kept... St- snowballing literally no pun intended if like you know the reasons why i'm sort of was getting indifferent to christmas but again the more i think about it even years ago like when i was little kid and before that do you think there's something really spectacularly messed up about having a, a story that 
got a bit of a base. He said, like, you know, I think was Saint Nick a real person? I, I, I think. And then, but you've got this element where people say to their like little kids or brothers and sisters that there's this person called Santa Claus that will, if you ask for something, obviously for like a Ferrari or something, but if you ask for something relatively, you know, normal like an Xbox or whatever it may be, you will get that present. Which is in theory quite nice. But until you realise that you know there's no such thing as Santa or there's no such thing as the Santa that people picture in their mind. So you sort of think, you you know you're telling somebody who as far as they're concerned, because chances are if you believe in Santa you're still quite young. So you are thinking this present's free. Like, but the person telling you this knows they've got really struggle to find the money to get what, like, well, even my second hand car, 64, I think it was probably £200. £200 in 1986 was a lot of money. So I was told, you know, to sort of, what do you want for Christmas? Name full well that that person, I say I was lucky, my dad worked, my sisters worked, there was money in my family. But they still knew that they had to get that money to buy that present for me. And then perpetually keeping this myth going. And I've said to like my, uh, I thought, oh, I forgot it. So I read on IMDb, somebody was partly set in the past. So, so at the moment we sort of set before the original, smoking, yeah, hey, uh, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, just have a, oh, the mat, the clippable mat, which wasn't clippable, I fell off my cup. Why do we mat stick to uh, cups anyway? I'm sure there's, um, Dripped, uh, dripped water, dripped tea or coffee, dripped water, what? Uh, yeah, uh, so I got a bit close to my there. So yeah, like one of these things where I like say, I've even said to some of my family members recently because you know, they've had like, I've got younger nieces and nephews and things like that, that like I feel like I'm keeping this Christmas myth going by even going off the car, I'm like, all right, Scrooge, and we'll get to that in a second, that, like, I feel like that sort of, um, I don't want my young nieces and nephews to go through, like, I want them to get cool toys, and they do, like, say, again, because I've got a lot of older relatives, and they still, you know, get presents from a niece and nephew, so it's all cool for them, because they've got, you know, it's like say you know uh, you know it's like you know sort of uh, you know it's all a bit of history repeated itself again to quote the song uh, it's a great song uh, surely Bassy for powerhead but um, yeah so my, my younger niece and nephew at the moment they are getting the cool toys and now for my idiot drunk family members coming and enjoying the Queen's Queen's speech and everything and I just feel like this is this weird cycle of like say 20 30 years from now my niece and nephew are going to be grown up and well, they have to be struggling to get like find money for a PlayStation 15 or whatever it is then or you know the brand new iPhone for their kids or you know friends relatives and things like that and it just seems like a very strange sort of that just reminded me of the character that kept all hiding booze around the house in the original uh, uh, Black Christmas uh, which is a which again signs this, uh, shows some of my alcoholic family tendencies that I think that's kind of a cool idea. But yeah, so I feel like it's a very strange concept to keep these myths and stereotypes going of, uh, oh, there's this thing called Santa, there's this thing, there's this person called Santa, and yeah, I'll bring free toys, and you know really there isn't free toys, and you're keeping all this misery going. And that's another thing that, like, again, you know, for the most part, I was pretty lucky. But then, since growing up and knowing people that suffer from anxiety and depression and, you know, kind of things like that, that some people really struggle at Christmas and I don't really particularly, you know, like hanging around my family if I can help it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but, uh, again, I was always quite lucky. The room that had a TV in it, on Christmas Day, I would sit in there and things like that. And for the most part, like, you know... I. I'm quite a social person, but at the same time, I kind of like my own company. So, like at the same time, I could always kind of you know find a you know relatively you know quiet way of going through Christmas. But some people really, really struggle with it and really hate the thought of going to see the family. Really don't get on with the family. Like I say, 
I think I've got a relatively quote unquote normal family that we don't get on, we do get on, but you know, we could tolerate each other's company just about kind of thing. But like some people, if you've grown up in an environment where you, for whatever reason, you really don't like your family, Christmas is a terrible time. Or if you're on your own, or you know, I say I'm lucky. Like if you said to me now, like if you said people celebrate Christmas, fine, I've got no problem with it whatsoever. Great. But when you get all these, you know, horror stories. Uh, again, no pun intended. Because we're watching the Black Christmas, but oh, oh with your banned Christmas, or oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, which is all total BS. Anyway, that's beside the point. But if somebody said to me this year, I'm not doing Christmas this year. There's no Christmas stuff on TV. There's no Christmas decorations in town or anything like that. I'd be, okay, it literally would not bother me in the slightest. So, it's kind of like, again, the, the more, you know, and, and, and weirdly as well, I never thought this would be the case. But I've seen multiple people now who think the exact same thing, who, you know, similar, you know, age range to me, similar background, you know not particularly religious one with the other sometimes they are sometimes they aren't but like are just like yeah Christmas whatever don't care and I think it's this proper you know don't get wrong I know there's loads of people that love Christmas and again that's perfectly fine but I think there is a a good you know I gotta plug this number out of thin air I reckon there's a good 40 45 50 percent of the population they don't give two stuffs about Christmas. Yeah, they like time off work. They like the fact that you can have to have a drink at 10.30 in the morning and nobody, you know, uh, obviously uh, Ben Bailey Smith did a great joke about, like, the great thing about Christmas was you can drink in the morning and uh, accordion phone, what's with them? Uh, uh, this film's got everything so far. Uh, smoking, uh, phones, and... Uh, but, um, yeah, so, yeah, I think most people quote unquote like Christmas for those reasons but again when you're just looking at it you know from a skewed perspective or a slightly you know just like like say almost looking at it from above necessarily but like say last couple of weeks and this has been the same for a few years now loads of the movie channels have Christmas movie channels now uh, loads of the movie channels have Christmas loads of the like you know, if you've got like say Sky or something like that or multi-channel TV which I guess all channel all TVs named multi-channel TV because you know it doesn't work like it used to just getting like a TV antenna and just getting the basic three or four channels you nearly always get you now 30 channels and radio stations and things but there's nearly always one or two free Christmas stations and things and just stumbling on Christmas films on TV and the last couple of days I've seen loads of versions of A Christmas Carol you know the Charles Dickens story obviously and with that you think the more you watch that film and you think Scrooge and that, obviously, you know, he could have paid his family members a little bit better, but that's his family members, his work colleagues a little bit better. But that said, Scrooge and that is basically a, a guy, excuse me, a guy just trying to keep himself to himself. I like the cold idea on the on there. Yeah, so he's a guy just trying to keep himself to himself kind of thing. But everybody in that film is like, uh, again, excuse me, I don't like that. So I'm gassy when I'm doing these commentaries because I'm just drinking coffee. But yeah, so you, you think, you know, he's a guy just trying to keep himself to himself, and everybody's like, oh, you're miserable, you are, you ought to celebrate Christmas and all this kind of stuff. And it's just like, what? And then, virtually every Christmas film I've stumbled on on some of these channels, like Christmas with the Cranks, and uh, I was watching a Matthew Bartrick one the other day with Danny DeVito in. And all these Christmas films are like, yeah, I don't mind if you celebrate Christmas, but I don't mind just stay at home by myself or whatever. And they're all like, no, you've got to celebrate Christmas, and we're going to drag you out in the house. And and it just makes Christmas seem really, really messed up. And and I like I remember seeing a thing, I think it was uh, Maddox, who does best web, page, best web page in the universe, said something about um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And I heard a few other people say this as well that like um, when it's like you know you look at the Rudolph story when you were a kid oh Rudolph you know people didn't like Rudolph they sort of took the mick out of him you know because he was different and things like that but then you watch, listen to that as a, an adult and again I've said this on loads of these commentaries and I know there's nothing worse than being all self-referential being able to deconstruct everything everybody thinks they're a critic now and everybody thinks they're like you know some kind of university professor or some kind of english scholar or something but you 
you listen to that Rudolph song now with even a really rudimentary understanding of like how to sort of uh, I don't know if I summoned it uh, if you if you syncing up you'll see why <coughs> um, but yeah in the sense that like uh, yeah even if you just got a real real minimal understanding of anything if you listen to the Rudolph song now what a horrible horrible song and moral that is that like they're basically like really like you know we hate you Rudolph you're different than us we don't want you hang around us you can't play our reindeer games you know you can't you know and then soon as there was a problem they needed Rudolph because of you know his nose could light up the sky which is even even more crazy element is that then they're like yeah come on Rudolph what and like I say I don't you know I don't get offended. I don't really care about that song. I say, oh, ban it and all that kind of stuff. But just, and people, oh, Rudolph, a nice song. What a horrible, horrible song it is. And that's one thing, actually, with Rudolph, with the nose lighting up and, and things like that. That, um, that, yeah, like, in the sense that, like, say, uh, uh, that, like, so it's one of these things, though, where, again, about Christmas, I feel like that that's one thing with the Santa Claus story is that the way sort of it makes people believe stupid things. And again, you kind of think, oh, that's harmless. You know, when you're a kid and you watch like silly you know, you read comic, do I don't say comics are silly, but you'll read like, you know, little silly stories and, you know, they're inconsequential and things like that. But I always look at it like, a bit like a, I'm a crazy cat person now, but if you get a cat when the cat is a kitten, the first two or three weeks of that cat's life, or the first couple of months, is really when you're hardwiring, built in, programming that cat's mind. So if that cat doesn't have a litter tray from a kitten, you'll find it very hard to use a litter tray, or, or it does seem to be the case, what a lot of people say, or if you've got like, say, a, a cat, and that cat is, you know, you're hanging around like a dog as a kitten or something, it will probably get on with dogs or small children or, you know, whatever it may be. And you're programming that cat as, you know, that's what that cat's going to be like for the rest of his life. And I look at it like more recently again, you know, when you're like one removed, one removed, one removed. Like as a kid, you think, oh, I believe the Santa story, one that stupid. But or, when you're a kid, even if you question the Santa story and you're like, this doesn't really make sense that how can he get around the world in one night and how does he get in people's houses and how is he watching you all the time and how is he naughty and all this kind of stuff which you know it's kind of like uh, you know you think oh harmless fun but if you think most people like say when I said earlier on if you believe in Santa I, I can't remember when I stopped believing in Santa I was probably I was probably I don't know, I, I feel like I was relatively late on, I was probably eight, nine, I don't know where it was, but anyway, if you, you know, four, five, six, seven, you believe in Santa, you have literally, you know, hammered into your brain that like, no, he gets all in one night, you've asked for this toy, you know, you go sit, you know, you go see Santa in a shopping mall or a shop or something, and oh no, that's all, there's all these Santas and all, all these places at once, and Oh, and oh, that's Santa's helper, you know. If you're, oh, it's like, no, it is Santa, there's loads of different versions of it and stuff. But, oh, he's got a magic key and he can come down your chimney. If you haven't got a chimney, you can just, you know, teleport into your house and stuff. So you're constantly being told that, like, this story, no matter how stupid it sounds to you, and even if you're a relatively bright kid and you question it, you're literally sort of, um, be made to think stupid things and again you think it doesn't matter just a kid but then again I've noticed this really recently I know loads and loads of adults that like I always used to think as a kid most and to be fair most people have got a certain intelligence level I'm not the sharpest tool in the box I'll be the first to admit it that said I've noticed loads and loads of people that will believe the dumbest, dumbest things. And it's not an excuse to, you know, make fun of people or rip people off or anything like that. But I'm astounded sometimes when I'll see people have brought something from a shop or 
gave their credit card details to somebody or you know done something that is so so stupid and I literally could not believe that sometimes people just have not got that like it's common sense I was trying to think of the phrasing but I guess it's just literally not got that like sort of um, hardwired built-in reasoning that like you know you hear stories on the tallies of uh, uh, on the tallies you'll hear stories on the tally of people saying oh well I got a phone call from my uh, bank asking me for my credit card details and asked me uh, to deposit like 10 grand in this bank account and they did and you're like why would you do that and I think part of it is again it might be a small element of it but it is things like the Christmas Santa Clausy type stories of you're literally making people believe something that is so inherently crazy that I don't see what good comes of it that like I said earlier on that you're making yourself stressed out you've got to pay for all the stuff and then you've got this you've got to keep this pretense going of oh there is a Santa and then when the kid finds out you've been quote unquote lying to them which I can quote you when you've been lying to them it's like why did you make me believe that for 20 years <laughs> but yeah that's my uh, Christmas rant rant there and uh, we're up to 1991 and they've been flashing up the dates it's uh, different times got a telescope there what's interesting as well though because uh, Bob Clark who did the uh, 1974 original like I always forget like actually that's kind of a brings me on to a double point a double point about a double bill but uh, I don't think I've really even seen it now but Bob Clark did I think it's more famous in America than it is over here but I think they show it all the time in America did something called a Christmas story which was like really nice really family orientated and then he did obviously the original Black Christmas and that's to me what a great sort of you've literally got the best of both worlds there but one of my dad's favorite films is the Bean Crosby film White Christmas and every single year when my dad puts White Christmas on I always think I would love to have a double bill with White Christmas and Black Christmas two completely different films nothing in common really apart from tightly uh oh vinyl record what's one of them I tell you what this film is awesome and this is again i feel like every I, sometimes i would think to myself, i'm sure i've done this commentary before because everything i say is always the same thing over and over and over i've seen on tv remember when that phrase meant something uh but um yeah that like this is this funny thing and again i've heard people like I can't paraphrase here, but I've heard people like Maddox say it and um, a dose of Buckley. But when you get like this new generation of like, I'm not saying like, because like say, I'm not saying say, oh, in my day. But like, you know, there's this new thing on the internet where it's quite like sort of uh, um, like a quasi fashionable thing to what's a corded phone, what's vinyl record, and all this kind of stuff. And like this is only you know less than a <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, this film's only less than a decade old, and you've still got all these things in in relatively in new films. That said, though, that kind of leads me on to another point. Oh, that's a good shot again through the Christmas tree. Uh, that's kind of cool though as well about things like that. They're about like uh, we'd be surprised if that was like an oversized Christmas tree or something like that. But it looks almost like it's like a miniature shot. That, uh, yeah, but there are certain films though as well. Like when I saw this, and it came out, I've got the cinema ticket somewhere. I think I, I recorded Black Christmas off the TV, and it was roughly around the time when this version came out. And um, I stuck the ticket on the box. Oh, a corded dial phone too. Even better. Uh, but yeah, so that uh, yeah, so I have to try to get the ticket there. But yeah, um, with this film, uh, that said about oh, you know, it's a film that oh, you know, young quote unquote young people should have seen because it's relatively new and it's like you know a horror and it, you know it's Christmas theme. So if you were watching a you want to watch a Christmas movie, chance it would probably be something like this. But that said, kind of leads me to a very long-winded point that um, this is a film I can't really, apart from when it very, very first came onto DVD, 
you just never see it anywhere. And in fact, I can't really ever remember seeing it in the UK to buy on DVD or VHS, and I'm sure it must have been. Again, you know, it's where they say, well, what's VHS? And I'm sure it was, um, uh, oh, it's, oh, is it an eyeball? Because that's not, oh, uh, where's Mythbusters when you need them? Uh, but uh, yeah, that like, this is a film. I literally do not remember it either for nearly a decade or like I can't remember the last time I saw this like I said a flea market or a car boot sale or and like um, sort of a, you know a second hand pawn brokery type shop and you just never see it on TV or like saying all these like Christmas channels it doesn't pop up on there and things like that so it is interesting when a film does come out and just disappears and I think as well I was reading there's actually two versions of this movie like a UK and a, U, a US version they're the hell they're making angels out of human skin again like the 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre well not really but you know want some good barbecue just had some cold coffee and they always say cold coffee doesn't have no taste you know what I think they might be right One thing as well, um, I was uh, looking for the uh, review of Black Christmas and uh, I went through my empires and was trying to find uh, the right issue that they got the review for Black Christmas. I mean, that's one thing as well, because it did come out in the UK around Christmas. But one thing I'm insanely jealous of is that American cinemas are open on Christmas Day. And this was released on Christmas Day in America. And I just love the thought of just, you know, being able to, you know, say to my family, yeah, I'm not going to, uh, oh, Clark's on a, there's a, a Clark University, I think, in America. I think that's a, one of the evening with Kevin Smith was recorded at Clark University. And that's Clark Sanitary, but just put me in mind of it. But uh, yeah, I just love being able to say to my family, yeah, sorry, I'm not going to do Christmas dinner this year. I'm going to see the Black Christmas remake at the cinema, actually on Christmas Day. Uh, but yeah, I was trying to find uh, the Empire magazine with the reviewing for uh, Black Christmas and I couldn't remember definitely but I knew it was released either late November early December in uh, 2006 or at least I was pretty sure it was and at first I was because all my empires were all mixed up all in completely uh, different order and things like that but um, I was trying to think to myself oh it's probably reviewed a couple of months before so I was kind of looking for like you know the September, October issue. Like I said, I know they're always a little bit far in advance. And then I kind of thought, no, what am I talking about? It'll, you know, it'll be the January, February issue. Of two th- and it is, it's reviewed in the uh, January 2000, uh, as we say, the January 2007 issue of Empire Magazine. And I kind of a sucker for a good coincidence, but I was trying to find a review for Black Christmas. And on the cover, it's a. Uh, Toby Maguire from Spider-Man 3 in the black super uh, Superman the black Spider-Man suit actually the funny great thing about it, the funny great thing the funny thing about it is uh, there's a Superman Returns advert on the back but what kind of completely sort of just made me think yeah not, the more things change the more they say the same but it got a terrible one star review and uh, well what is kind of funny though, because it's like literally talking about Rocky Balboa coming out and then you think Creed come out like in America and things like that it's like you know it's like wow you know you fast forward you know, all these years later and it's like oh cool but yeah uh, let's try and find the review now it's uh, you know Jack Daniels adverting here it's got a picture of snowman and casino where I'll review there was a spec to come out the other week Oh, it's just quite funny. There's two reviews together is um, the Nativity Story and then Black Christmas. Details to be confirmed, to be confirmed. Uh, stuck at 15. Perfectly timed for Christmas. Uh, perfectly timed for those who find Christmas as appealing as the flu. This remake of the seminal 1974 slasher now takes no presents in eggnog and mixes them up with a deranged serial killer, bringing a different sort of surprise to a sorority house. But with all but two male characters taken out of the updated plot, the ladies had to be more resourceful than in the original. But despite the presence of several seasoned scream queens, the death still come faster than the snowstorm outside. 
the original gave John Cobbs and most of our dad as uh, ooh, the original gave John Cobbs and most of his ideas. So ex so expectations are high. However, what starts off as a smart bit of female ass kicking quickly becomes a pile of slush that wouldn't chill a snowman. And that's reviewed by KB. Who's KB in Empire? I can't remember. It got one star. But, um, yeah, so that's always like, you know, I kind of love it when a horror film gets a really shitty review in the in, a, in the paper or a magazine. And that kind of actually reminds me, because I always think of Lars from Metallica saying that any of the really terrible gigs that he does always get, I'm sorry, all the good gigs he does always get a terrible review in the paper. But that's another thing though as well, how times have changed it, like... I, even now I don't buy Empire nowhere near as much as I used to like I buy it probably about three or four times a year and I can remember when Black Christmas came out like say when I taped um, Black Christmas off the TV and I say it was roughly when this remake this remake was knocking around and I put the cinema ticket on the box and the review out of the paper I clipped it out of the paper and stuck that on the box to the original for some reason I don't know why but yeah it's proper like terrible review I couldn't find it else I was going to kind of try and read it out on the commentary or pre uh, scan of it and things but uh, yeah the, I think it's kind of funny in some ways that like they're like now like I barely even last time I can remember reading a review for a film in a newspaper you know it's, or especially cutting it out I mean it's probably like I mean I think the Thing prequel and I think the Wolfman remake were some of the last newspaper adverts I can distinctly remember saving but that's another thing as well the, the more you fast forward go into the future is that like uh, you know like I was you know again I don't want to say too new age about it but I've always tried and be a bit like you know I try not to be sexist if I can I try not to be racist if I can I try not to be xenophobic if I can but even more and more about feminism it really was funny to like just get like my phone out and just going through like the cast list and stuff I'm thinking what it's all women you know, and you think like you know, so many horror films are like you know the the girls like oh save me. I don't know why they would say it's such a. <laughs> I'm trying to oh, save me. I can't do the. I can't do a high pitched voice at the moment because I'm not a singer in a metal band. But yeah, so it seems funny that like you know to think that like again a horror film like this though that again probably deserves you know obviously not oh, this amazing amount of credit, but you know that does deserves a little bit of credit. I'll just check if that was. Uh, who the the woman in the cardigan was I don't pass regular porn <laughs> I'm sure it's Elizabeth Elizabeth Eliz, Eliz, Olivia Hussey she's a terms offensive really don't that was one thing that we um, uh, talking about like just going out like you know looking on the IMDB for this film and stuff was um, I looked at the director uh, Glenn Morgan and um, you just stand on the screen, and you're already down to battery power. I wonder what the closest to a computer was in the 1974 original. It'd be good to check it out. I'm sure there's a guy that cooks sausages with this weird electrical thing. I'm sure that that's probably uh, yeah. I was looking at uh, Glenn Morgan's. Uh, I can't believe I've just said what's the closest to a computer? A sausage, a sausage cooking device. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I noticed he done directed three things, and um, one of them was this, another one was Willard, and another one is the X Files TV series one episode. I was like, oh, that's kind of random. And then I clicked on his um, writing uh, page, and I was like, he'd got that episode, the new episode of the X Files. I thought, okay, kind of cool. But then I noticed he'd wrote like um, uh, fourteen episodes of the X Files. It says the X Files written by fourteen episodes, nineteen ninety three to nineteen ninety seven, and a tally play from nineteen ninety four. So I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, yeah, just try uh, try find out who that um, that cast member was. No, the, who the hell am I thinking of? There's someone in it named, um, the guy is named Oliver Hudson, which is kind of funny. Uh, same initials. How the woman out the original? This is professional. <laughs> that woman there with the uh, the pearl necklace and the cardigan, which uh, that's a sentence I was as expected to say on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Adrian Brody. 
Adriana Martin, who played Phyllis in Black Christmas, Nancy's in Force, had an interview that she hadn't thought about Black Christmas for 32 years. Okay, the blue one, Glenn Morgan, after all, was there. House mother in the movie. Oh, Andrea Martin, there you go. She looks familiar to as well, that the, uh, the, the main, the main women. <laughs> It's always weird to watch somebody throw up in a film. And click, take arrow. Oh, Nightmare on Elm Street. The new Nightmare on Elm Street is what I really, what she just she just does horror remakes, <laughs> which is fine. It's good week if you can get it. It's the Marcus Nispel method. <laughs> One thing as well, I do love when I just pulling a magazine out just at random. But I would like to say this, uh, well not random, because I say for a very, very specific reason, but uh, bringing out this empire from 2007, and like, like I say, I'm always fascinated by, and as much as I sort of like taking the mech out of, like say, these memes that like, oh, what's a corded phone and all that kind of stuff. I do kind of like seeing that just even going back to 2007 and just flicking through this empire, like there's an advert here for HD, DVD, the next generation of DVD and things, and you know, sort of, you know, there's a habit here for a, a, a Blackberry uh, phone and things, and you know, sort of just thinking like, you know, I've heard here, Superman Returns and Power, team up with the good guys. So it's always an advert, a big massive advert for HMV, it's about 10 pages. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Double Agent Xbox Xbox 360 GameCube PC Five Stars New on DVD Click Which uh, she was in Click Oh that's funny I think this is the uh, first part in the commentary now where I can actually try and be a bit scene specific. <laughs> There's a bit of a nod back to Psycho there, obviously, with the eye popping out of the... Uh, but what's... Um, that's it. That angle didn't work. I mean, I'm not very good with angles, but that doesn't seem like um, that angle would necessarily work. But that's what I think is interesting though as well. Like I say, talking about the origins of uh, it's not oranges, more like damsels, damsons or plums. No, uh, talk about the origins of like horror movies though. If that like, you know, you do you do think you know you fast forward back to seventy four and fast forward back to rewind back to seventy four and you think Black Christmas obviously was probably a setup for a lot of things and things and then you know you sort of think like you know text change the mask and things like that. But even that. That obviously harks instantly back to Psycho, which is 1960. You know, a woman being killed in the shower with the guy with the big knife and uh, the voyeur element of it, you know, 14 years before, you know, before the original version of this, let alone, you know, how old is Psycho compared to it from now? And again, I know I say it's in loads and loads of films, but like, oh, loads of commentaries for films I should say but to me if you just see smoking in a film it just makes it a little bit more believable to me that like you know even now I know two or three people that still smoke you know the the four people I know and uh, you know so it's kind of like there's one of these things that where you know, it's completely erased from movies almost like as if it's like you know and I was saying this to someone the other day is smoking one of the things that's perfectly legal to do, but you can't do it in films without apologising? <laughs> I think a lot of the snow in this as, as well looks really realistic. I mean, again, I know it's one of my bugbears and commentary when people say it was before CGI and it's like you know nineteen you know nineteen ninety nine or something you know, but uh, but with uh, yeah that snow look you know I don't think it was necessarily real snow but it definitely looked good I mean it doesn't really look fake and that's one thing I think sometimes fake snow can 
I think you can get away with it a lot of times, but that looks pretty looks pretty natural to be fair. I was just looking at my uh, intensely written uh, commentary notes on the uh, intensely written, um, in-depthly written uh, on the back of an envelope. I was just wondering if I'd missed anything out. I don't think so. That's another thing though as well. And I'd like say I ate it when sort of, um, you know, because I've had it happen sort of to me, like we'd say, either just being from the UK or just being into the things like you know i'm into like metal and things like that there it's so easy for these cliches and stereotypes to you know oh are metal fans like this or do people from the uk all have butlers and things but like oh you see in a load of american films that there's like a walkway where you can go under the house and you know you see it in a million movies you know it's funny how that woman's in the elm street remake because there's one part where you see the origins of Freddy's glove and it's a trowel, like, you know, so it's like, uh, not a trowel, a gone for, uh... Try to find that guy, you wee, what the guy, the Night Rider guy, the Night Rider guy. Oh, he's definitely in something really classy. Like, um, it's a really weird, it's one of the few good films I've seen, and I was really surprised that, like, um, I remember thinking, oh, that guy looks really familiar, you know, just like the voice and stuff, and it was like, oh, yeah, it was uh, the uh, the guy is Richard Basehart. Um, oh, God, I can't recognize any of these films. <laughs> It wasn't that classy after all. It was the origin of the term paparazzi, I know that much, but like I say, I know he had a really cool voice. And that's one thing I must have talked about this in our films there, if she's getting into the attic there, but um, I think watching something like Evil Dead, Way Too Young, and again, Psycho, but I hate the thought of I attics when they're just a little bit open, or, or like, you know, you see a window in a house, like, you know, somebody walking past, it always sort of, uh, always kind of freaks me out of it. Oh, he was in the Alfred Hitchcock era, that guy who did the intro voice to the uh, Night Rider. Lestrada. Oh, no, there we go. That's how that's what it was. Whatever Lestrada is. <laughs> oh, that's what it was. Oh, yeah, it's Fellini. I knew it was... Uh, <laughs> And it was somebody, uh, not Bergman, yeah, it was Lestrade, and he's the fool. But I'm sure, like, say, that's the, uh, I like that as well. That's like, almost, it's like a really uh, terrible superpower I've got. But um, no matter, like, how sort of classy the film is. And sometimes, I don't think I ever really try to do it, quote, unquote, on purpose. But um, that, um yeah, but no matter how good or bad the film is, I can instantly like pull it back to well, well, interesting case in point, you know, to ta you know, really time stamp this commentary. But Rob Robert Loggia unfortunately passed away yesterday, and I noticed on my Twitter feed that like you know, people saying, "Oh, rest in peace, rest in peace," blah blah blah, and uh, and I thought, God, oh, wow, that name sounds really, really familiar, but I just couldn't place it, and so I went on his IMDb page and I'm scrolling down the list and I was like. Oh, he's the uh, bad guy from Over the Top. And it's like you've got all these people mentioning things like Scarface and all these really cool things and classy things he'd been in. And literally the thing that I sort of vividly picture him thinking about it was Over the Top. I like the shadow on the wall then and that's one kind of a cool thing that harks again back to Psycho but when you see like uh, Marion's reflection in the mirror when she's in the uh, petrol station bathroom and she's sorted out the money to pay for the car that um, 
um, you see a reflection in the mirror and she's got this almost she's as if she's a different person and thinking you know before she she stole the money and when you see sometimes Norman's reflection uh, you, you, it's sort of harking you know you're harking back harking back to it's sort of saying that he's sort of two people and like there that shadow on the wall is almost like sort of um, you know sort of reference to sort of sometimes when people are, are in two minds about something or there's like a shadow is flickering as if say you know there's like it's chaos and it's like sometimes when you try and read a scene in a film though it's super pretentious also one of the first times I did that was in Clockwork Orange too. I feel a list coming on reasons Black Christmas remakers like Clockwork Orange three reasons I also think Clockwork Orange ends at Christmas it hasn't been remade yet I like that as well, that's kind of an old school sort of there, uh, the uh, lady from the original, I forgot her name already, <laughs> uh, she just said about driving and she said the other one of the younger women was like, in this weather, well that's one thing as well, uh, I'm not doing a very good job of it but I do try and not be like, oh in my day, but like, um, one thing I have noticed, and again probably could just be rose tinted glasses or whatever, but I don't ever distinctly remember the first say 20 25 years of my life not unless the weather was insane it really affecting how people drove now i feel like you get three flakes of snow on the ground and it's like i was like oh that's a the country cries to a halt i say that's another thing though that was always something that always used to make me laugh that like you know you'd get people even when i was a little kid but, oh i remember it used to snow every year on what we should have a white christmas every year and you're like really really and i literally even though i grew up in the 70s uh i can barely remember a white christmas and nearly all the more recent white christmases i can remember are from the last 10 years or so so it's actually pretty cool like when people are like oh or oh, we used to snow more in my day it's like no it didn't it snows more now if anything <laughs> I say it's always a good excuse to watch, um, like say, uh, the original, uh, I might, probably not probably not later today, but well, probably, probably later today, I don't know, um, but I, might, I definitely might watch, I might have a 74 double bill, the uh, original Black Christmas, and uh, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I can't look like a Sierra then, I can't think it's to get the, uh, the car movie database up to see, uh, well, I think I was checking car movie database the other day. Can you believe Koyana Starch is on the car internet movie database? So I was like, oh my god. And if you haven't seen Koyana Starch, hey, get on it right now. Well, listen to the end of this commentary. And then, actually, now I've put, put Koyana Starch in because it's way better in this country. But uh, yeah, um, uh, Koyana Starch has got, it, A, it's a great movie, and it's got a ton of cars in it. So the fact it's on the car movie database is like, uh, you know. Car insurance quotes it's trying to fit oh that's a bit sensible. Car inter net Oh that's quite cool. That was one thing actually I I noticed uh, Mortal Kombat X <laughs> nearly dropped a phone then into a mug. <laughs> Luckily it was empty. <laughs> <coughs> uh, yeah, well, I saw Mortal Kombat X Pack 2 has been released. The, the releasing add on packs. Uh, I am managed to get Mortal Kombat X recently because I thought you had to buy the full £70 pack and I didn't really want to pay £70 just to play as JC Voorhees, but I found out now you can buy them separately about three ninety nine. And I noticed Tyrone Magnus had reacted to Great Channel, by the way. One million subscribers, woo! Uh, God, it seems weird I can't do none of my rubbish impressions. Uh, 
But uh, yeah, I noticed um, a, a pack two had been released this Mortal Kombat, and one of the characters is Leatherface, and I thought it was kind of cool there. At first, I was like, "Oh, he's apron." How many horror killers wear an apron? Also, that's kind of funny. It's wears a tie and apron. It's quite posh. Uh, he's like, he's got a job. But like, I thought the apron looked way too clean. And then I thought to myself, "Oh no, that'd be good in Mortal Kombat." You know, I'm rubbish on beat 'em ups. I thought if you start fighting, I was wondering, just your apron gets splattered with you know, Raiden's head flying off. His Raiden still ain't probably. I don't know. I've played Mortal Kombat for a long time, as you can probably tell. Uh, but yeah, when that blood splattered across the uh, car windscreen, I uh, just instantly made me think of like, you know, that's one great thing about the snow and things like that. In the new Friday 13th film, from what I can gather anyway, Sean Cunningham said it's not going to happen. I mean, unfortunately, I was reading the original writer, and he was tweeting saying, oh no, I was enjoying working on the new Friday 13th, and got a new writer and stuff. But yeah, the new Friday 13th films might be set in the snow, and it's like, oh, Crystal Lake in the snow, I would love to see that. Uh, yeah, but see if uh, Black Christmas is on the Carby database. He's my cat. Isn't he? Oh, Lindy. When he's on a blanket, all snug. Oh, that's a great shot. That reminds me of a seance on a wet afternoon when the police knock on the door. Try to get a screenshot comparison for that. Be funny if the uh, 74 ones on here. Oh, they're both on here. What oh, Black Christmas? <laughs> it's got two, two cars. Oh, that's quite pretty cool. Uh, is uh, what the uh, the estate uh, car is a 1966 Plymouth Fury, and the one that looked like a Sierra is uh, a 1989 Dodge. Daytona. There's not a car newer than the 90s in this film. The 74 one. We have there's only two cars on that. Oh no, there's one. The 1970. Oh, that's quite cool. What was the other one? Uh, oh wow. There's two Plymouth Furies in. There's a, oh, that's awesome. Plymouth Fury is what Christine was. And the 74 one, the police car is a 1974 Plymouth Fury. There's a 1973 Plymouth Fury. It's a. <coughs> <coughs> oh wow, really so well. Even more reason to watch the uh, the 74 one again. I noticed there was that a, was that a mobile or was that just a cordless phone? I guess it's a mobile, right? I love out there with horror films, and I must say this on every commentary, but like, you think, oh, when well, you watch the 70s one, well, you won't be able to do that film nowadays because a mobile phone ruins everything, and I love about this film, it's like, they've just all got mobile phones, it's like, yeah, okay, same film. This is a really sort of atmospheric film, and I think I may have re quickly referenced it earlier, but um, a lot of people on IMDb were you know, really praising this film up and saying that they watch it a lot and things like that, and that really surprised me because even some relatively good horror movies, you go on IMDb sometimes and you know, oh this is worse, especially a remake as well, you know, oh my god, you know, oh this is the worst film I ever know when he was good to the original, blah 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 blah. And most people are saying, this is good, it deserves to be a little bit better, you know, it should be held in higher regard really, you know, there's a bear esteem for it, like, but yeah, it's good. Always kind of cool as well because you know I've seen so many horror films now that no unless it's like you know I'm watching it at three o'clock on my own with the lights off or something and you suddenly like, Ooh. but um, yeah that you know you still sort of you know and I, I've sometimes you know quote unquote 
can relax watching a horror movie or I fall asleep listening to heavy metal and things like that. But just there, then you know, every so often you do sort of, you know, you get sort of like, like ooh, I wonder what's going to happen, that kind of thing. And that's another thing, though, as well, talking about, you know, sort of American sort of cliches or stereotypes and things like that. But one thing I'd love to know if it, as that, I'm pretty sure it is true, but and I think I've mentioned on previous countries, but these sorority houses, uh, and I've noticed it in like someone like this or Sorority Row, Girls of Sorority Row, which again was of course remade, and uh, you know, like you say, Scream Two, and all these different things. Um, that all the uh, house tapes are like Alpha Better Sega Dega and all this kind of things, and all these like Greek names or Omega and sort of all this kind of stuff. But is that really the case, dude? Do all these names are they really like? Because it just it seems so. I don't know. It just seems like it's just like like when I was a kid growing up, like I was part of a house at school, like I was part of Hargreaves House at school, and there was Beach and. Uh, Hargrove, I think, was one or something like that. Uh, no, what was it? I was. I was Hargrove, there was Peach, there was Seal, I think, was one. Uh, and you've got the ones in Ho uh, the Harry Potter films as well and stuff, but it's a bit more like. I don't really prefer American stuff to European stuff, but. I like that. All this, like, Baker Hager Sager Hager, like. It's like, really? And as well with this one, normally I have the sound up a relative amount. I don't hope the sound is sort of filtering over, but like, uh, you know, try and be a bit more aware of things like copyright strikes and things like that because, you know. It's all fun and games till the, the eyes come out. <laughs> oh, that's quite cool. Anyway, that, that's a pretty freaky with the guy's face. To be fair, that eating the eyeballs thing, that's a pretty original, crazy concept. I mean, I never would have pegged it as, you know, but again, talking about, like, talking about cliche and things and inventing the origin story for things. That's a great thing about the 74 one where, you know, the killer is in the house kind of cliche. I mean, again, I don't think it was the first version, but, you know, kind of cool though. And again, how many, how many, how many floors to this house? Since you got the the bit underneath where you can go in, there's about three or four floors and an attic. <laughs> that's really cool. That's pretty freaky. I mean, that's like say, I mean, I'm watching this like saying the afternoon curtains wide open. You know, it's a bit overcast, but loads of light coming in, and that's pretty weird. If I was watching this at like say three in the morning. <laughs> You're my family now. <laughs> That's a great line too. Guy. How much flex with two eyes? I know it's a real eye, I don't know how it works. Do you want that because? I know there's supposed to be two versions of this film, and I didn't really look into it which version, the hell of it, which, the, the hell which, I didn't look into it which version I was watching, but, um, 
I don't really remember this ending at all. <laughs> Oh, that's kind of cool as well, and they fall into the side of that. And it's little things like that, though, where I remember Romero saying this about, like, in lots of a Batman film or you know, something like that. And, you, know, you understand that you've got to work in the limits of what that series or franchise dictates. You know, you can't just suddenly you know, break into a musical number as well. It's like if you do a horror film, maybe or something. But it's kind of cool to think, though, that, you know, something like this where. I know I've seen it before, but I have you know, I, you know, I really should have watched it before. Did the commentary? It's probably anyone listening to this commentary probably wish I had done. Uh, but, uh, but that said, just you know, just the way I've been watching it, at least they've thrown a couple of their own ideas in it. That's pretty cool. Just times like that when you'd be glad that the house wasn't particularly well made. Uh. A flaming Christmas tree. <laughs> And there's something quite cool though as well about say, because it's obviously like say a day like Friday the 13th, it's, you know, it's inherently spooky, but like even something like say Gremlins, which is obviously a horror comedy, there is something quite good though about like, you know, try and make, you know, something that has got this like, hey, it's Christmas, to just make it like, I was done that quick then for a second. <laughs> Where are these people in the cast list? Because there's about four people in, I think. Uh oh. Sequel. Full cast. the classic talk about the stereotype that's a really great one though I don't think that's their meaning enough credit but uh, somebody who does autopsies eating and drinking while they're doing an autopsy that's a really great one. Oh yeah they are all these uh, all the news reports the news reporter was jilted the medical examiner was Jerry Wasserman so he's credited as reindeer I've really not been paying attention. <laughs> I think I've said it before, I'm literally one of the few people on earth that if this ends like it's going to be a sequel, like the killer's arm flies out of this body bag, which I assume it will. I can't really remember off the top of my head, but I'm, it must do, surely. Um, I'm sure that must happen. But I'm one of the few people that seems to genuinely love these endings that's like, you know, most people feel proper ripped off as they say, uh, you know, that like, oh yeah, there's going to be a sequel, like we watched all that film for nothing, and it's like, you yeah. know. Uh, I mean, a perfectly good drink. <laughs> I mean, no, it didn't turn out what it was about when it was going to end there. And it's not very often you can say this. Two supposedly dead killers have come back from the dead. And that's kind of a bit of a modern uh, sort of take on the horror movie. Again, 
It was a Black Christmas for that, I can't quite remember, but um, multiple killers. That's kind of a cool touch, because sometimes you think, why can't this killer be in two places at once, or, you know, and then, the, no, it's just, there's just two. Oh, what? Remember that? It's kind of cool though that like, um, and I kind of like horror films like that where they like bookended by, I think this was bookended to be fair, actually kind of was, <laughs> uh, where you've got the central portion of the movie where it's set in and around a certain thing, but it's got like, again, I guess it's like, like Text Chainsaw Massacre because I love that about Text Chainsaw Massacre, the way until they get in the truck after they've been to the uh, graveyard, uh, the truck, the van, I always feel like they could get away. Like, you know, the, the, it was like, you know, the, it wasn't past the point of no return. I wonder if Kay Presley and Pete Chalmers, I wonder if they are uh, crew members, uh, just because I've got a random crew member all lined up, ready to go. Uh, transport is the, the clue there for the random crew member, just to prove that I haven't just uh, made it up. Like, I don't know people who do transport of uh, the <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I always think, it, yeah, it's not beyond the point of no return when, you know, before they get in that van and a bit like this in a way, I quite like how it's been bookended by, like, you know, the scenes at the start and then, you know, this, you know, I always associate it with just being in that sorority house, I kind of forgot there was this hospital setting. It's the Halloween 2. <laughs> What's great about that is my mum and my dad always saying, and I think I said it on the Halloween 2 commentary that I did, but like you see hospitals in movies and they're either really ridiculously well lit with loads of people in them or like the really really dark with nobody working there and I kind of like the the second one where it's like on the one hand you know it's like uh, I've really been in a lot of hospitals at night you know touch wood you know, hopefully I don't have to be in there but yeah let's say that like um and our hospitals, our, our hospitals, our hospitals this uh, dark uh, late at night, right? Probably, but I mean, probably not. I don't know. Who's to say? I mean, I could just go walk past the hospital down the road at night and just see if there's lights on. I don't know how I do that. It's good, it's good to get out of the house, isn't it? I honestly looked at that then and thought it was like it's because I've I've got the think about the seventies one in my head. I thought it was like a Commodore Pet or something, which I'm guessing wasn't invented in the seventies. I think might have been. <laughs> Reindeer! Oh my god, that's brilliant! I can't even believe it. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the guy? Oh, that's funny. I want that guy being. If I make a horror film, I'm going to have that guy in it. And then nobody will know it was that guy. If that person's still alive, he's been in my horror film. No. about them uh, heart paddle things uh, the other day that where it said it was like virtually you can't barely use them basically it's like I've always freaking dreamt it I mean I have to stop drinking while I've got a cold I think it was a is there a horror a horror author named Sean, Sean Houston who wrote Rats I remember him once talking to Bruce Dickinson on the radio on Rock show years and years ago 
and he said he got a cold and I think he said he'd been taking some medication and he was like he said like about to try and go sleeping counting like burning sheep flying over it and then he goes oh what's a burning sheep is it like and I kind of always picture that when I'm you know so just think wow that's a did I, did I dream that <laughs> Put shadow on the ceiling there, it's pretty cool. Ooh. Game over me. I like the use of shadows, that's cool the way they like they like changing there. It's going from yellow to green, yellow to green, that's pretty cool. What's well, I think I said Mythbusters earlier, which is finishing again time stamping the commentary, but um which I never know is a good idea or a bad idea, it's kinda of cool if it's timeless. But um yeah, and I'm pretty sure if you fall onto a Christmas tree, even if it's a real one, there, uh, you know, that you, you would you would probably just, you know, oh, I don't know, maybe. Oh, there you go. Directed by it and screenplay by the same same guy, Roy Moore. Oh, Moore. But by Shirley, the son. Can't remember that, but uh, Bob Clark, that's was when uh, Bob Clark was still alive as well. Oh yeah, my random crew member, I just have to, I wrote, the name is Peggy Archibald, but I will just find the name on the umdub. Oh, Shirley Walker, oh, Shirley Walker's past the past, it's a pressing commentary. Peggy Walker is in the, uh, tri uh, Peggy Walker. Peggy, if you get your name right, right? Uh, Peggy Archibald is in the transportation department according to IMDB and was driver and additional photography. Actually, and that leads me on to my next point was I didn't notice that at first. That's a kind of um, a very interesting set of jobs of uh, driver and uh, additional photography. But going through a list of movies that she's done is uh, Dim Sum Funeral Driver, Possession, 2008, Driver, Slash Hair and Makeup, which, you know, then Driver, Second Unit, uh, on the fourth kind, then on Iron Invader, Driver, HMW, which I don't know what that means, and then the company you keep, Driver, Slash Wardrobe and Hair. So, yeah, there you go. Peggy Archibald, random crew member, try and spot her in the credits. Again, something like the score in this movie as well. I mean, always a great sort of thing just to sort of uh, just turn the uh, sound down a bit just in case she sort of uh, bleeds over. But uh, mm. uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, always a good place to listen to the uh, score just going up there. But yeah, Black Christmas 2006. I thought it was Tom Morello, then the uh, guitarist from. Um, Rage Against the Machine. Excuse me, sorry. <coughs> oh, I get some gas. Oh, I'm surprised to say money. There's a very money, very money, a very money. Oh, so it's twice. A very Murray Christmas has appeared on Netflix, and it looks like it's sort of a spiritual quote unquote successor to Scrooge. To Paul Schaefer's in it, Paul Schaefer's in Scrooge as well. I haven't seen it yet, so it could go either way. Levine. So, in relation to the, the singer, Contact Lenders by Rob Miller. You know, the eye thing again. Oh, wow, that, no, that's a proper last sequence. It's just a little bit of music there. It's just, dun, 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 dun. Remind me of Jaws. So that's electrician. John Williams. Sucker for a good coincidence, as I say. Bronstein. Bron oh, Bronstein, I should say. Remind me of the, um, the lady who does the voice for Lois and um, Family Guy's name, Bernstein. Clearance slash product placement. What product placement was in that film? The phone, maybe. 
was the newest thing, and that was the phone. It was like a phone movie database, probably. Wayne Johnson. Wayne the Rock Johnson is broke up. Part man, part man. Cater is always the one to go for for a random crew member. That's simply fine, catering. Spec Mayor, is the name you see over there? Kevin Dave. 25, that's cool. That's very, very Jaws esque. I'm going to take the score. Fancy Eagles. Oh, Freeborn as well. That's Stuart Freeborn was the guy that designed. Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't said, but there was a Wilcock. This guy that designed Yoda in Pine. I'm going to check who did the music before before it goes off. <laughs> What year did the Commodore pet out? Stay tuned. <laughs> With this dramatic music playing, it's like, oh my god, oh, I've cut it off from the, the wrong thing. It's also reminds me of Jason X a little bit. Who did the music? We'll never know. Uh, cast and crew. Music by. Sh oh, of course, the music by Shirley Walker. Of course, why an idiot? Shirley Walker, who worked with John Carpenter, who did Halloween. You know one of the crits there? John Carter. Close enough, I'm having it. <laughs> Peggy Archibald was the person who I should have been looking for. Another catering again. First take catering service. First take, uh, see what they did there. It's always got to think of a wheel out of a pun. I don't know really like a pun, but a catering pun seems to just always make me smile. 2029, senior vice president of production. Let's have that finished now. Simply to my engagement again. And I, I don't even know once. Have I seen this in the future? <laughs> Synthesizer programming, Shirley Walker. Synthesizers. Three D animators. Uh, would it be before CGI? People be saying. First film was CGI. It was Toy Story Three, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, it's like that drops by now. <laughs> this commentary is just like a rant about things that are better at the moment. <laughs> Digital intermediates. I nearly said that's where the rots are to digital intermediates, but no, it's not like that digital print song can be good. Everybody's waiting for the man with the back, what a great name for a song. Silent Night, Jingle Bells, before my Frank Sinatra, Deck the Halls, Kissy and Mark Ferrari. That'd be cool if that's that person's real name. The Nutcracker, Carol of the Bells, The Nutcracker Suite, Waltz of the Flowers, The Nutcracker Suite. I don't know if any of that classical music's in. Um, I've got to do a, a list of how Clockwork Orange and this are the same, right? It's got classical music, it's all the same. The Mammoth Association with Movie Central. Participation in the province of British Columbia. Production services, tax credit, Kodak, motion, picture, film. Digital media by IO Film, pure digital. That's pretty hard to see those logos. Almost side by side. Directors Guild of Canada. It's a foreign film from Canada. Number 42,313. It's one of the newest ones we've done. Still in the 40,000s, I still, as far as I know. The 
Don't have to apologise for smoking then either. Line of the free, eh? Should we walk and jump off together? Okay, for my leg. Oh, does he come? 